Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We'll be starting this next session now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. I would like the people at the end of the hall to please allow us to start the session. Let me turn it up. Good morning. Good morning, everyone standing at the end of the room chatting. Thank you very much. We need to start our session. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to this workshop, Public Health Online Shadow Regulation Access to Medicines. My name is Ron Androff and I'm serving as the moderator of this session. Our esteemed panelists joining me on the days today are Mrs. Oki Olafui, Gabriel Levitt, and Dr. Arya Ilya Ahmad. Oki Olafui is a pharmacist, healthcare manager with 20 years of community practice in pharmacy in Abuja, Nigeria. Dr. Olufui has served as Secretary, Committee of, on Ethics, Association of Community Practice Pharmacists of Nigeria, Abuja branch, and is currently responsible for the Secretariat, Facilitation, and Reporting of the National Committee on Essential Medicines List. Her years of practice in community pharmacy and Masters in Health programs support her knowledge and experience in drug dispensing, inventory control, National Drug Control and Advertising Unit, and Federal Drug Manufacturing Lab. Oki's knowledge of supply chain and quantification issues in Nigeria and Africa runs deep. Gabriel Levitt is the president and co-founder of Pharmacy Checker. Mr. Levitt is responsible for research, managing the online pharmacy verification and listings program. He is also a public advocate for prescription drug affordability in America, Internet Freedom, and the United Nations. He has testified before the United States Congress on issues relating to access to affordable medicines and Internet freedom. Gabriel is also president of the United Nations Association Brooklyn Chapter. In his pharmacy checker role, he was among the original drafters of the Brussels Principles for the Sale of Medicines over the Internet. Dr. Arya Ilyad Ahmad is a Global Health Research Fellow at York University. Since 2014, he has also served as a consultant to the World Health Organization, addressing issues of medicine safety and vigilance. Arya is a past Duke Global Health, Fellow, Health Policy Fellow and has spent the past 15 years working on pharmaceutical policy issues at the intersection of academia, civil society, and international organizations, as well as the public sector, including testifying before the Canadian Senate on Canada's access to medicines regime. Ari received his MSc in Pharmace Pharmaceutical Studies from the University of Toronto and his PhD in Global Health Governance from the Basili School of International Affairs in Waterloo, Canada. This past Monday, at the Day Zero session, Arya presented his seminal discussion paper entitled Digital Governance of Public Health Towards a Regulatory Framework for Internet Pharmacies. And hard copies of that discussion paper are here on the corner of the table if anyone would like to pick one up. Otherwise, you can retrieve an electronic copy uh, at, of this uh, via the QR code that's noted on the top of the document. Ten years ago at Sharm el-Sheikh IGF, the sale of medicines over the internet was first brought to the Internet Governance Forum. And while significant progress has been made in development of safety protocols, very little progress has been made regarding addressing a harmonized set of norms, rules, and laws that allow for safe international dispensing until now. Now we are undertaking a multi-stakeholder approach to resolving this growing public moral health hazard. Dr. Ahmad brings a unique view to the discussion, having worked in the field of falsified and substandard medicines for the past decade, including in multi-stakeholder forums like the United Nations and the World Health Organization. While the discussion paper's initial, initial scoping review examines studies, stakeholders, and existing regulations of internet pharmacies, using North America as an example, 
It also touches on European Union regulation and legislation. Clearly, these are serious issues. As much in Asia and the Global South, as you will hear soon from our expert pharmacist from Africa, Oki Olafui. It's important to note that Dr. Ahmad's document is grounded in human rights and global public health perspective. Equally important, the discussion paper is a thoroughly independent exercise that represents a living document at the nexus of internet governance and public health. In fact, it represents a primer on this crucial topic intended to stimulate discussion and debate. According to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, access to affordable medicines is an essential component of the fundamental right to human health, fundamental human right to health. For this UN, from this UN statement, the Brussels principles state, we affirm the following principles relating to the sale of med medical products ordered for personal use over the internet. Access to affordable medical products is a fundamental component of the right to health. Just months after the Brussels principles were created at RightsCon Brussels 2017, the UN Human Rights Council tabled a resolution for, quote, the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standards of physical and mental health, including access to essential medicines. In fact, this discussion is rooted in the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly 3.8, which speaks to, the access, speaks to access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable medicines. So what are we discussing today? Public health online, shadow regulation, access to medicines. Indeed, shadow regulation, as noted in the title of this workshop, is a loaded term that connotes different meanings to different people. The Electronic Frontier Foundation described shadow regulations as, quote, voluntary agreements between companies, sometimes described as codes, principles, standards, or guidelines, to regulate your use of the internet, often without your knowledge. EFF goes on to say, shadow regulation has become increasingly popular after the mon monumental failure of restrictive internet laws such as ACTA, SOPA, and PIPA. This is because shadow regulation can involve restrictions that are as effective as any law, but without the need for approval by a court or parliament. End quote. But online access to medicines is the driver of this discussion today. Online pharmacies defined as websites that market and sell prescription medications over the internet that is delivered by mail order began operating in the mid to late 1990s. In North America, by way of example, the issue of purchasing medicines outside of one's own country gained public attention through media coverage of bus trips which brought seniors to Canada to buy medicines and were sometimes sponsored by U.S. politicians supportive of reforming drug importation laws. Some Canadian pharmacies later began partnering with licensed pharmacies in other countries such as Australia, New Zealand, the U.K., and later India and Turkey as well as those in free trade zones. High drug prices are one of the main reasons that Americans go online to buy medication. And the Center for Disease Control has estimated about 5 million Americans are dependent on international markets for medicines, mostly due to high domestic drug prices. Millions of people are dependent on internet pharmacies, as you will soon hear and they have safely imported medicines ordered online pursuant to a valid prescription for their own use. As detailed in Dr. Ahmad's discussion paper, it's not the violation of federal or state laws that threaten public health, rather the actions of rogue pharmacy operators who sell fake or otherwise dangerous medicines. Most importantly, this discussion is about real people in real circumstances. It is a people issue with lots of complexity. It's about actors in position of authority who make the rules that we, the people, must all live with. 
The discussion paper and the engagement we hope will follow is in search of a common understanding of safe personal importation from a global public health perspective that moves beyond technical restrictions under the guise of protecting consumer safety from rogue websites. Online pharmacies, in the business of selling genuine medications dispensed by a licensed pharmacy and pharmacist that require a patient's prescription, should not be considered rogue pharmacies. So this morning, we'll be looking at three overarching questions. Can the multi-stakeholder approach that led to the Brussels Principles serve as a model to inform the development of standards and best practices to ensure safe access to medicine over the internet? Two, what is the most appropriate transnational forum for inclusively and transparently addressing the internet governance and public health issues associated with internet pharmacies? Three, Internet pharmacies have emerged as key stakeholders advancing technical and policy approaches to balance public health and consumer choice. What are the opportunities and challenges associated with intermediary efforts to regulate internet pharmacies, including the dot pharmacy GTLD and trusted notifier systems? We agree with United Nations Secretary General Guterres who noted in his remarks during the opening ceremony here, quote, invention is outpacing policy changes. The governance gap must be addressed, end quote. German Chancellor Merkel put a sharper point on it, stating that lawmakers need to quickly, quote, identify which analog rules we want to transfer to the digital world. She continued, technology has to serve the people and there will be new possibilities when every voice is heard. The hope shared by our panelists is that every voice can indeed be heard so that one day soon, we, the people, will have the same trust in safe internet pharmacies as they do in brick and mortar pharmacies. People all over the world who need access to safe, low cost medicines need new norms, new rules that address our 21st century needs. Now, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Arya Ilya Ahmad to give us a brief introduction to the high points of his discussion paper. Arya. Thank you for that introduction, Ron, and for setting the stage for today's discussion. Um, I would like to begin with two housekeeping notes. Uh, first, Ron mentioned the discussion paper. Uh, that paper is based on a scoping review uh, of the range of stakeholders and their interests, both state and non-state, existing regulatory strategies, but also considerations for future opportunities. As such, it is a working draft that is meant to serve as a primer in order to, as the name implies, stimulate discussion. And in fact, since our pre-event on Monday and conversations throughout the week, it has already undergone some changes. So even if you've grabbed a, a copy, uh, I would urge you to pick up a fresh copy today um, that you can get uh, around the room uh, or uh, by using the, the QR code on the first page. Uh, but also to provide feedback uh, in, in refining and developing uh, this uh, manuscript and this body of work. Which leads me to my second point. Since intellectual freedom is important for academics, I have to declare that I do not have any financial or professional conflicts of interest. The broader research project, drafting of this discussion paper, and me being here are funded entirely by my academic institution, York University. So on that note, let me briefly explain why I'm indeed here today. For those who can't see what that uh, picture is, uh, that's an aerial photo. Uh, that dark shadow you see is a Chinese customs agent walking over millions of boxes of medicines that were seized under suspicion of being falsified or substandard. My work over the past 15 years has uh, been on issues of access to medicines, with a focus on drug safety and vigilance issues, by working across civil society, governments, academia, uh, but as well as multilateral fora like the World Health Organization. In addition to contributing to the first ever estimate on the scale and scope of the problem, my work with the WHO included setting up uh, and, and contributing to the first ever global surveillance and monitoring uh, system for substandard and falsified medical products. As you can see even in this uh, two documents in this picture, the issue is rich with complexity with multiple competing interests. That includes public health considerations, socioeconomic impact, uh, that is uh, global, uh, of course, in nature, 
and when you're talking about surveillance and monitoring, it requires uh, global cooperation, particularly uh, within a multi-stakeholder forum like the WHO. Now, balancing these competing interests is a regulatory challenge, yes, but it also comes down to the quintessential challenge of trust. How can I be sure that what I'm taking is safe, efficacious, and quality? It might help to begin with how trust is mediated in the analog world in physical pharmacies. The nexus of trust includes including the patient, healthcare providers, uh, usually physicians and, and pharmacists, uh, and medical products can have life-saving implications, of course. But that trust, uh, trust is uh, mediated by things like actual products uh, that can include uh, brands and trademarks, uh, and with the actual uh, dispenser and, and the professional certification uh, as well that occur uh, within uh, a, a physical environment uh, where you can actually have face-to-face -face, uh, engagement. Now, in many parts of the world, access remains an issue, and that is true for the one in three people that don't have regular access to life-saving medicines, which amounts to about two billion people, the upwards of 50% of people that don't fill their prescriptions, uh, in part because of cost-related reasons, and the millions of deaths that could be prevented uh, by improving access to affordable medicines. Now enter uh, the great uh, disruptor, uh, the internet. While access to the internet remains an issue in many low income countries, billions of people are increasingly uh, going online and using it for a variety of different reasons and purposes, including e-commerce. Reasons why the internet would be used to access uh, medicines uh, include, of course, cost related issues, but also others like convenience, privacy, uh, and speed, et cetera. On the cost issue, which is uh, the predominant uh, reason why people use uh, online pharmacies, internet pharmacies, uh, we're talking about, in some cases, uh, according to a recent study, of upwards of 70 to 80% uh, of savings on, on drugs uh, from uh, safe uh, sources. The reasons why medicine costs different in different countries are complex, and we can get into that in the Q&A, but the reality is price arbitrage can facilitate access, uh, and uh, uh, the internet uh, can, can help. But the internet is not all uh, cats uh, and, and roses. Uh, because of increased globalization of supply chains, there's a stratification uh, in uh, legitimate and serious threats uh, in criminals and others taking advantage of an open e-commerce marketplace to deceive patients uh, or pose risks to the health through falsified or substandard medicines. This risk, in many ways, has led to a restrictive and, in some cases, uh, enforcement uh, approach. So uh, in some uh, cases, for example, um, this is entirely appropriate, uh, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, this report that came out uh, in the US a few years ago, particularly uh, concerned with issues of opioids. But uh, if we are to adopt uh, a patient-centered public health focus, uh, as the WHO uh, is mandated to do, the argument around medicine regulation uh, is one uh, of finding the right balance. That includes acknowledging that there is a risk to under-regulation. Uh, these, as noted, include public health risks from a free and uncontrolled market that exposes patients to substandard and falsified medicines, but also a lack of trust in health professionals. And so that poses a significant public health risk. But likewise, there are risks in over-regulating this issue or inappropriately regulating this issue. Not only can they serve severely restrict access, but there is also risk uh, potentially to uh, diversion. Uh, and so these uh, are also uh, important risk. Uh, and so there's a number of papers that are increasingly coming out uh, where social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook are increasingly becoming unregulated markets uh, for medicines uh, because the reality is uh, desperate patients will find desperate ways to, to access Access medicines. So really, what we're, uh, uh, what we're, what we're in need of uh, is a regulatory sweet spot, uh, one that protects consumers against rogue websites uh, and bad medicines, but at the same time promoting access to uh, a safe and affordable quality uh, essential medicines. Now, whenever you have a legitimate competing interest that needs reconciling, uh, you have, uh, in a sense, a regulatory challenge. But regulatory challenges, uh, in many ways, are fundamentally about rules. Who sets the rules? Uh, why uh, and what interests inform those rules? Uh, what fora and where uh, do the rules, are, are rules developed and where do they apply? Uh, under what methods, what uh, approaches do you take? Uh, and ultimately, uh, that dictates um, uh, what uh, is, is, is applied. So how the issue is currently uh, being uh, regulated is something that I want to talk about. Um, as the uh, Internet and Jurisdiction Global Status Report that was unveiled yesterday uh, quips, every problem has a solution, but every solution also has its problems. But allow me to briefly survey a few examples of state, non-state, and Internet intermediary approaches to regulating Internet pharmacies. At the state level, um, there are different ways different countries approach this problem. Uh, and uh, one of the credentialing companies, Legis Grip, puts out these internet uh, uh, pharmacy policy guides uh, for countries uh, around their laws around uh, importation. 
Uh, but in many cases, uh, regulation of medicines uh, more broadly falls under uh, either uh, the Ministry of Health uh, or regulatory authorities. Uh, and if I can use the U.S. Uh, as an example, uh, that, uh, for example, falls under uh, both uh, the, the Ministries of Health, the, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA is bound to laws, and because of jurisdictional issues, there are two sets of laws for internet pharmacies. For those, uh, and, and there are additional uh, uh, agencies at the federal level that are, that are involved, that can be involved in this issue as well. Um, so for those uh, that uh, are, 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 are domestic uh, and only sell for domestic markets, there are a set of laws for uh, internet pharmacies. The landscape is different, of course, uh, in if you want to uh, import medicines. And this, of course, is important uh, because cost is increasingly becoming an issue, not just in LMICs, uh, low income countries, but also in, in places like the US. Uh, as this report, uh, for example, illustrates uh, that um, for uh, uh, the most commonly, uh, most popular uh, brand name drugs in that period of time in about the last 10 years, prices have increased by about 208%. Now, under federal law, uh, importing medicines is technically illegal under uh, the FD, uh, FDTA. Uh, at the same time, uh, the FDA has uh, what it calls this, uh, a personal importation policy or discretionary uh, 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 guidelines uh, where under particular conditions, uh, it, the, it, it urges uh, the Customs and Border Patrol not to enforce uh, in a way uh, or, or, or provide flexibilities for patients. And this is particularly for U.S. consumers that are importing up to a 90-day supply uh, of non-controlled medications for personal use. But uh, this remains in many ways discretionary, uh, and that becomes important when we look at some of the non-state actors uh, that uh, are involved uh, in this particular space. Now, along with regulatory authorities, professional associations like pharmacists are quite important. In the U.S., uh, again, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacies is an association that represents boards uh, of pharmacies and has associate members in Canada and other places as well. Now, the NABP has been running the Verified Internet Pharmacy Program, uh, as you see over there, VIPS. Uh, it, in deeming what websites are safe, however, the NABP takes uh, a, a technical uh, interpretation uh, that some have argued may uh, be too restrictive, whereby any website that markets or sells prescriptions uh, importation into the U.S. are automatically uh, non-compliant. Now, in addition to the NABP, there are other uh, creden private creden non-governmental credential uh, entities. Uh, with these websites like LegitScript, for example, the Canadian International uh, uh, Pharmacy uh, Association, uh, as well as PharmacyChecker.com, provide information uh, and guide uh, patients uh, on where they can access cheaper medicines from uh, a select list of uh, certified uh, internet pharmacies. There is scholarship uh, that is increasingly emerging that when these internet pharmacies are credentialed, the safety concerns are addressed, as in this paper uh, that argues that uh, in some ways peer review is, is not interested anymore in, in results showing that credentialed online pharmacies uh, are, are, are safe. Over the last uh, uh, few years, of course, internet intermediaries have also become uh, important stakeholders, increasingly shaping important aspects of internet governance. Now, in many ways, these intermediaries, which m most of you are familiar with, uh, is, is reflects the, the quote and the challenge that the UN Secretary General a couple of days ago uh, invoked, that innovation in some ways is outpacing our capacity to develop appropriate guardrails. Uh, and this in some ways represents the, the, the hare and the tortoise uh, challenge. I will briefly talk about two such intermediary approaches uh, to regulating internet pharmacies and how in some ways they can restrict potentially access. In 2013, uh, ICANN uh, made about 1,500 top-level domains uh, publicly available. Uh, among them was uh, the dot pharmacy uh, domain. Uh, the operation of which was, was granted uh, to the aforementioned um, NABP. Now, at the time, there were two sets of concerns that some uh, organizations, a, a range of organizations, uh, uh, issued uh, uh, with, with this particular uh, 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 arrangement, including a petition uh, with, with about 24,000 uh, 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 signatures. The first had to do with conflict of interest. Should an organization, despite uh, uh, legitimacy and, and good intentions, but one that represents pharmaceutical uh, pharmacy boards uh, and has received funding from industry, uh, including uh, six pharmaceutical companies, uh, to file uh, the um, uh, application for the dot pharmacy domain, um, uh, be entrusted uh, with uh, the uh, dot pharmacy TLD? Uh, which has also in some ways uh, 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 supported almost exclusively by, by entities with, with uh, commercial interests, uh, including uh, some uh, uh, non-state uh, organizations. Um, 
Now, this a related concern was whether a national association with a particular interpretation of even its own domestic law on importation can fairly adjudicate what entity can and cannot get a dot pharmacy domain. Uh, and in fact, the NABP uh, has adapted its criteria for VIPs uh, uh, for uh, the verified its, its domestic verified internet uh, uh, pharmacy program that any website marketing or selling imported medicines into the U.S. is inel ineligible for uh, the dot pharmacy uh, uh, criteria for eligibility uh, as well. Now, last year, ICANN issued a notice of breach of domain uh, agreement to uh, uh, the NABP in part for failing to be transparent and expeditious in evaluating uh, the, the applications for the dot pharmacy domain. There are also efforts to introduce uh, trusted notifier uh, systems, and these emerge around issues uh, of, of acute public health, like opioids, for example. The idea taps into one of the most significant challenges in entering governments, and one that intermediaries like social media platforms, uh, third, third party platforms, are being challenged on, and that, uh, in a sense, is, is DNS uh, abuse, and particularly the issues around content DNS abuse. In the current system, as the global status report shows, intermediaries uh, are often receiving notices or takedown requests that is increasingly happening uh, without uh, uh, court orders, which can compel intermediaries like uh, uh, DNSs or search engines to censor or take down content. The trusted notifier system uh, aims to identify select experts that can notify the intermediary uh, that prompt a uh, follow-up. The idea is to move away from an informal, non-legal, and private notices to requiring either court orders uh, or, or um, uh, a follow-up uh, that is prompted by uh, the, the uh, advice of a group of uh, a select experts, uh, the trusted notifiers. As some commentators have noted, however, there are potential challenges that need to be addressed with the trusted notifier system, and these include, uh, in, in some ways, issues uh, that, that uh, uh, it, uh, b before the trusted notifier system uh, were, were true as well, in terms of who can be a trusted notifier, how many of these uh, uh, trusted notifiers do you need to, to take action, uh, and can it, in some ways, again, morph into these non-legal uh, takedown, content takedown um, uh, 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 approaches. Now, what we have, um, and, and this is something that, that, that some uh, have, have pointed out, including uh, uh, this, this particular book, uh, which I urge for anyone who's interested in, in thinking uh, in, in this idea of, of, of internet intermediaries and their regulatory role, uh, as well as a UNESCO report uh, that in its beginning uh, uh, called into uh, question the operation of internet intermediaries are heavily influenced by the legal and policy environments of particular states. Research <laughs> findings highlight the extent of which state policies, laws, and regulations to varying degrees are inadequately aligned with the duty to facilitate and support intermediary respect for freedom of expression. Uh, and subsequently talks about uh, some of those uh, extra legal uh, content restrictions uh, or what uh, 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 it can be classified as beyond uh, regulation. Um, now, what, we ha what I briefly described is a patchwork of regulatory approaches, stakeholders, and interests that have a broad impact on public health and access to medicines. I would like to finish with a set of reflections uh, for, for moving forward uh, that the scoping review uh, allowed. The first is that the internet uh, represents, um, and the unification of the online and the physical world, represents uh, new jurisdictional uh, and regulatory challenges. So this prompts the need to think about regulation not as a matter of if, but how, uh, and uh, prompts us to look at these intermediaries uh, in a way as new quasi-legal functions that they serve, and that's in, in, in the report as well. Uh, but also that we need to think about where we have these conversations, and that in a sense, global problems cannot be addressed by national law. And in the report, uh, where it uh, looked at over 200 key experts in the internet governance space, 80% uh, uh, indicated that we have insufficient international coordination uh, and coherence uh, to address cross-border legal issues uh, around the internet, uh, internet pharmacies uh, being one of them. Now, the second is that uh, fundamentally this is an issue of mediating trust uh, 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 and more broadly over the internet as well. Who does the mediating based on what values and how is it reflected in the regulatory approach? And that gets us to this idea of, of balancing interests. Not all interests are equal and foundationally we need norms and values to drive the decision making. Some have argued for a broader set of human rights based on the UN Declaration of Human Rights around cyber nation rights that uh, uh, individuals ought to exercise uh, beyond uh, national uh, jurisdictions, and that's perhaps an idea worth uh, exploring. 
I'd like to lastly uh, talk about one particular uh, example of, of, uh, of a type of norm diffusion uh, and norm-based uh, process that, that led to, um, uh, or, or in, in this particular space. And it started in, in 1917 uh, at uh, RightsCon in, in Brussels, where a group of, of, of uh, multi-stakeholder actors uh, were brought together uh, by, by a loud New Yorker uh, that you'll hear from uh, later in the room, um, that developed a set or, or, or sought to develop a set of principles around which uh, standards and guidelines uh, and best practices could in the future uh, be shaped. And the following year, uh, I participated in a process in, in Toronto at RightsCon uh, about uh, shaping, refining, uh, and, and, and uh, debating uh, uh, these that ultimately became the Brussels Principles on the Sale of Medicines uh, over the Internet. You can find this document at the end of the discussion paper, but it contains uh, seven principles that are aligned with normative language adopted from international organizations uh, and, and international organizational documents, including UN Declaration of Human Rights and the World Health Organization. And while the, B, uh, the Brussels principles are not the final word on the matter, they do represent one norm-based multi-stakeholder approach that could potentially inform uh, future action in this space. But moving forward, there are other forms where this intersection of internet governance and public health can be instrumentalized into harmonized standards, guidelines, and best practices. That includes fora like the IGF and technical uh, for, uh, internet governance fora like ICANN uh, and jurisdictional fora like INJ or RightsCon. Uh, but at the same time, it is important to reach out to international other international bodies that approach issues from a public health and human rights perspective, and that includes uh, technically uh, regulatory bodies. The WHO, for example, recently underwent the most extensive reform in seven-year history, including adding a, a department for digital health. They are worth talking to. Uh, I'm also in dialogue with the World Health Organization's group on Substat and Falsified to put the issue on uh, their work plan, the issue of internet pharmacies. But there are other regulatory uh, bodies, such as, for example, uh, oh, that's the seven. Uh, as, as this group, for example, the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities, uh, that uh, on a technical level uh, deal with issues of uh, regulatory harmonization, as well as potentially uh, thinking about standards organizations like the International Organization uh, of Standards. Uh, moving forward, we hope uh, that a norm-based, multi-stakeholder uh, approach uh, helps uh, shape uh, this issue. And uh, we'll now hear from our next panelist. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Um, indeed, lots of information, and I have to say that uh, I've been privy to the gathering of this information over the last period of time, and uh, it's really exciting to see that there is a group of people gathering together from different uh, parts of the uh, stakeholders that, map, that are mapped in this sector to really look forward to see how can we find a way to harmonize um, all of these very tricky issues to find a path forward that really is a, not a trade issue, but rather a health issue, and look at it from that perspective. So thank you very much for this work, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how it unfolds in the, in the years to come. I'd now like to talk to, uh, to turn the floor to Dr. Oki Olafui to bring a developing nation's focus to the issues that Ari has highlighted. Uh, things are very different in Nigeria. And um, I need to move this forward. In fact, I'd like to give that to you. Um, I'm sorry, so I was just uh, saying that uh, things are very different in Nigeria. In 2018, um, this nation of 200 million people uh, got their first certified ISO standard lab so that Nigerians could actually do the quality control on medicines in their own country. That's just quite literally uh, two, within the last year and a half to two years. So this is a, a very important uh, aspect and very important information to understand that um, when we talk about the global north, it's a very different situation than the global south. So I think that they are now working on your, getting your slides up. Okay, so we'll just give them a moment. And I'd like to uh, also mention to those in the hubs, um, I was uh, received word that we need to uh, have the speakers announce their names before they begin speaking. So if we could do that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mark, how are we with the slides? Need a moment? Well, good morning, everybody. 
I'll just start all the same. Um, I've been well introduced. I'm a pharmacist and I uh, have a master's in health management. I've been involved in a lot of issues concerning earth, health. For me, health is not just a profession, it's a passion. And this morning, I would just like to start by referring you to the uh, sustainable development goals on health, specifically for medicines, the third one. And it speaks about uh, universal health coverage for all um, in relation to access to medicine. We also have the human right um, uh, in injunction from the United Nations. It looks at um, the possibility of the highest possible health for all in the world. That being said, we know there have been a lot of issues concerning regulation of medicines in the world. What, what do we really want to reg regulate when we talk about medicines? We need to regulate the research, the development, the manufacturing, the um, sales, that's marketing, and um, the dispensing, the prescription of medicine. All of these are factors that need to be regulated when you talk about medicines. For patients, I, I titled my talk as um, a case for a patient-centric and evidence-based regulation for medicine. Patient-centric and evidence-based policies for medicine regulation. So this says that whatever anyone will be doing concerning the regulation of medicine and everyone that is involved in regulation of medicine, that's namely will be the government. We talk about the civil society, the regulatory authorities themselves, and then we have um, those that manufacture, the people that do the M&E on medicine, and all of that. They all have to have a patient-centered view on the regulation of medicine, and the patient, in other words, must be king and the center of all that we do. For statistics, I have um, good knowledge from the WHO that half of the world still lacks access to medicine or healthcare, first and foremost. 30% of the world lacks access to essential medicine, and 800 million people currently in the world spend 10% of their income on medicines and 10 million of the 800 million are poor as a result of this. With all of this, with the desperation to get healthcare and access medicine, people have turned to the, okay, thank you very much. People have turned to the People have turned to the internet, to online pharmacies to get access to health and medicines. So we now have um, the emergence of the online pharmacies that Ari already mentioned. These are online practices that try to make access to medicine easier. With the globalization and the internet, we now have a narrowing of the gap to knowing what is where, at what time, and how to access it. The cost of products are also readily on the internet. Current regulatory efforts at this um, online pharmacies, though, are either known in some nations, like mine, Nigeria, there is no regulation whatsoever for online pharmacies. In some places, you have regional regional kind of regulation, and for now, Europe appears to be the only one that has a regional kind of regulation of online pharmacies. For global, there is zero regulation for online pharmacies as we speak, and this, of course, is a huge challenge. The benefits of um, the online pharmacies I would like to highlight at this point. Sorry, just to get this right. 
Okay, so we have benefits from the online pharmacies emergence. One of it is lower prices. We have the privacy. Some people just don't like walking into pharmacies to buy medicines if they can't help it, and everybody knows they're going to do that. We have um, the convenience they offer. There are people that can walk even from being ill, and so walking into the pharmacy will be saved by doing an online trans transaction to get medicine. We have medical information being increased. A lot of these sites offer information on health and tips on health. We have broader choice now in pricing and other areas because of the online pharmacies. We also have access to locally unavailable medicines now from the emergence of online pharmacies. They also an attempt to answer the issues arising from the sustainable development goal and the human rights situation I already mentioned. Risk have, however, also come along with their emergence, and one of it is inadequate protection of um, personal information and financial information of clients. We also have some of them lacking physical addresses and telephone numbers. This makes jurisdiction difficult when it's needed from just not having um, a physical address. We also have um, on expected access fees. When you do your ordering of these medicines, you think you're paying so much, but when they are being delivered or somewhere along the line, you find that there are some fees that were not advertised. We also have erratic price changes on um, websites offering online pharmacies. The regulation for now is a huge selling. That also is a risk. The challenges as we speak will be the emergence of the rogue actors, we also call them cyber criminals or illicit online pharmacies that engage in illegal sales of controlled substances, products that should ordinarily not be sold without prescriptions are available from some online pharmacies that we describe as cyber criminals. And then they also do their dispensing of medicines, sometimes through unlicensed pharmacists and pharmacies. The challenges continued. We have a lack of physical address of some of them, as I already mentioned, and this makes jurisdiction difficult when one has to seek one. Global law enforcement um, efforts so far have been very limited, mainly from uh, the Interpol and um, the UN Office on Drugs and Crimes. These efforts have been very, very limited to get justice for those that have been uh, affected by these rogues. The key issues then would be, can we have a, uh, in choosing a maintenance of safety? That is an issue. Could we have um, the emergence of an inclusive global governance mechanism that would engage in multidisciplinary actors or engage multidisciplinary actors from the global public health? the IT and law enforcement to sit at the table and come up with um, a kind of standard for practice of online pharmacies. Another key issue is um, the thought that there should be an ability to leverage on existing health and internet um, governance structures to actually pro provide the standards. More key issues that have come up include the low level of awareness of um, even the online pharmacies themselves and then the rogue actors. Even their mode of operation keeps changing. You try to shut them down somewhere, they go with a new name to another site and people continue to fall victims to their practices. Key issue still, could we then push as we have the theme for the Internet Governance Forum for this year, for one world, one net, and one vision in the sales of medicines on, online by providing a kind of credentialing and accreditation system that will lead to a standard practice for all and the uniformity probably of pricing. All key actors in the e-commerce, e 
specifically for pharmaceuticals now. We, I named some of them already, but um, I would like to now include the advertising agencies, the people responsible for um, the, the borders in countries, the regulatory authorities themselves, the government, of course. Did I mention the civil societies? All of these people that have something to do with the supply chain of medicines must become patient-centric and use evidences in their promotion of their roles. Currently, the attempt by some nations to kind of prevent a fair platform for regulation, for me, would be monopolistic and um, self-serving, to say the least. I would also say it's an issue of mor immorality or morality, and um, probably it needs to be reviewed. There is therefore, sorry about that, is there I would, another, another key issue is, um, is there a reasonable ju ju justification for price discrepancy of same brands of medicines as we currently have it by same ma manufacturers across borders? What this is trying to say is currently you can have a drug from the same pharmaceutical company in two nations offering as much as 10% or should I say 10 times higher pricing. Pfizer could have a drug in Nigeria for maybe $10 and maybe in Ukraine for $100. The discrepancy sometimes is that much. Is it possible to actually sit down and find out if there is a justification for such a practice and why and could it be surmounted? Globalization and the internet, we know, has narrowed the gap in lifestyle, culture, tradition, and, um, if you will, religion, as we say today. There's no doubt that commerce has also been affected. And so we have to face the reality that eventually there's going to be a pressure, even from the consumers, the patients, on governments, on the civil society, even the global governance system, to ensure that pricing, the regulation of medicine, it's like we have at the theme this time, one world. I would like to highlight the African situation where I come from. Currently in Africa, we have good training of pharmacists. I hope I'm an evidence of that. The national bodies are also well um, coordinated. They have strong national bodies of pharmacists in Nigeria. We have even the continuous education system where yearly you bring pharmacists together to renew knowledge and know the current global trends in pharmacy. We have um, premises have to display their licenses and um, for the premise itself and the, the pharmacists in charge of that premise. We also have routine physical inspection of pharmacies in Africa, a lot of places in Nigeria, where I come from. The database for pharmacies and pharmacists is also pretty good. You can even find some online. However, medicine regulation has not um, actually has the same kind of applaud. Currently, we have improvements, no doubt, in Nigeria and some African countries, I'm aware, we have the real active in ingredient testing that affords you the opportunity to actually know the content of your medicine within seconds and know if they are genuine or not. We also have a verification code that is imputed on some medicines and allows you to actually do an SMS to a number and know if that medicine is also genuine. These are great innovations in uh, regulation of healthcare and medicine in Africa and Nigeria. In spite of all of this, we find out there's still a 30% penetration of fake and counterfeit medicine in Africa as against the 1% you have in the developing world. Countries in Africa, practically all of them have regulatory agencies apart from Sarawi. And um, unfortunately, of the regulatory um, authorities, 7% of them are moderate in capacity to regulate. 90% actually have minimal capacity at regulation. 
there has been attempts to actually form an African medicine regulatory authority. It has been brought to the table at discussions at the EU, AU, sorry. But as we speak there, it hasn't become a reality. So there's no regional regulatory authority in Africa. Still on our African situation, our borders in Africa are very porous, but there is a novel information because currently in Nigeria, we have all land borders closed just to enable the government to review the things that go on at the border, which includes the importation of um, pharmaceuticals. Nigeria has a population of about 200 million people. Of those, you have a hundred million on the internet. I'll come down to that anyway. But um, Ron mentioned this already. It was just about two years ago, we had our first international WHO pre-qualified lab that can do testing on medicines right in Nigeria. Currently, we have about three of them, but for a population of 200 million, you agree with me that that is definitely not enough. For health-seeking behavior in Africa, currently you have people rely on prayers. They go to the traditional um, medicine manufacturers that just mix some concussion together and tell you it can do this and do that, maybe like 10 indications from same drug. And um, you use them, the side effects are usually, side effects are usually enormous because now you have the active ingredients and the dangerous substances all combined in one and offered to patients. So this is a, another dangerous strain. A lot of people cut off the hospital in Africa and Nigeria, they prefer to go straight to pharmacies, where the pharmacy then becomes the doctor that will do the consultation, do the prescription and the dispensing of medicine at the same time. This is another dangerous practice we have there. Just if you go to the hospitals, the public ones are usually very loaded with people. Sometimes you have a doctor attending to about 100 people in a day. And so you don't want to go to the hospital to wait if you can help it. So people to save the waiting time, go to the pharmacy directly or do these other things I already mentioned. We also have just a few go to private hospitals. Obviously, from a financial standpoint, many cannot afford to do that. Tanzania, as we speak today, is the only country in Africa that has a WHO pre-qualification on their national regulatory authority has been well functioning. Tanzania actually has two regulatory authorities for medicine. All that we have talked, I've talked about will point at a lack of inadequate governance for medicines and their regulation, technical expertise, scientific tools, funding, and a legal framework for doing the regulation of medicines. In Nigeria, we, like other African countries, I already mentioned this, you can get your medicines without prescriptions. You can go to the traditional alternatives and medicines are sold even in places like the market. On buses, you get somebody come on a bus and tells you he has this product that can do this and do that. And um, you see people, even enlightened ones, because of the issues surrounding access to medicine, actually asking to buy these products. In Nigeria and some African countries, it's possible for a non-pharmacist to own and run a pharmacy practice. And you can imagine what comes out of that. Still on the African situation, we have a population in Africa of about one point, and I want to go to the internet statistics actually. In Africa, we have about 101.3 billion population but of this 465 million alone are on the internet. That is obviously a very sad number. We have 18% though rise annually in e-commerce um, activities online. Also e-commerce activities, of course. This was said to be since 2014. That um, I got from the United Nations uh, um, uh, Trade and Development Authority, Conference on Trade and Development. 
In Nigeria, I mentioned already our population is 200 million. We have 111 million internet users and 27 million online shoppers. This information is from 2017. That for me should tell everyone here today that there are opportunities in e commerce in Nigeria and Africa. Currently, there's no data on online pharmacies in Africa, but in Nigeria, I know we have about 14 of them. There is absolutely no regulation. And they offer medicines without prescriptions, just like the brick and mortar pharmacies. So to conclude, the nations with the poor regulatory systems mainly being the African, maybe some Asian countries, we need to develop a willpower to actually step up when it comes to medicine regulation. Globally, the advocacy has to increase. When we want to regulate medicines globally, we need to think of the patient. We need to consider evidence-based policies. You don't just go around politics income and profits in doing things relating to health. And um, I finally put there that health, just go here now. Health is a springboard for every other thing we do in life. You need health to attain your full potential, individually or as a nation, globally as well. So we cannot afford to bring health to issues that politics would want to toy with, as we have it in the world today. And I end by saying the patient remains king in everything we do concerning health. We, are, we want a patient-centric and evidence-based attitude in policies when it comes to medicines. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Oki. That was... Uh extraordinarily enlightening. It is um, interesting to see just the size of the population and the internet penetration and recognizing that with the 2030 goals that we've heard here at this conference and in other places, we, this is where the new uh, people coming online are coming from. So if we could find a way to come together and uh, create a set of uh, standards under the Brussels principles that online pharmacies could have some, uh, regulation in the form of almost self-regulation is not necessarily having one government or even a, the, uh, the United Nations or many governments come into some kind of ratified treaties, but rather a set of protocols and standards for safety and patient-centric. So this is really extraordinary. And I would say that you are indeed evidence of good pharmacy training. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll now turn to uh, Gabriel Levitt. Uh, Gabe is one of the authors of the original Brussels Principles, as mentioned earlier. He has a long history in this space, and uh, as you will see, very passionate views. Um, I'd like Gabe to share with us uh, the origin of the Brussels Principles and how they've evolved to what they are today. And also, as Pharmacy Checker is a place to find low-cost medicines online, perhaps you can share some thoughts about medicine pricing. Gabe, the floor is yours. Hi, um, I just want to say that it's an honor um, to be on a panel with uh, Oki and Aria. Thank you. And um, uh, Ron, thank you for setting this stage. Um, I might not go in the same order that Ron had introduced me in terms of topics, but um, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, USA. So happy Thanksgiving. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here at my first UNIGF. Please bear with me. I know we're here to talk primarily about internet governance and policy, but for a few minutes I'm going to talk about drug prices, public health, and human rights. Then I'll try to tie it into internet governance. But first, I have a few questions, and I've been excited about being the guy that asks questions. By a show of hands, how many of you believe that a person in one country who has a valid prescription, who cannot afford a life-saving medicine, should have the right to travel to another country that has much lower prices, buy it, and bring it back home? 
Show of hands. Okay, almost everybody. Um, let's say they are too sick to travel, okay? In principle, how many of you believe they should be able to order it online from a safe online pharmacy that is mailed to them from that same pharmacy that they had previously traveled to? Okay, last question. Let's say a person with HIV was traveling back from India to their home country with a three-month supply of life-saving antiviral medicine. Would it be a violation of their human rights if a government officer stopped them and took their medicine because their otherwise lawfully manufactured life-saving drug was not technically a registered medicine in the home country? Would that seizure be a violation of their human rights? Thank you. Thanks for answering. And I would note for those who are uh, not in the room that it was about an 80 to 90 percent show of hands on all three questions. <laughs> Sorry. I'm wearing two hats today, so let me start with hat number one. I'm co-founder and president of PharmacyChecker.com, which verifies online pharmacies and compares their drug prices. We launched that service in 2003. Pharmacy Checker is one of four non-government online pharmacy credentialing agencies mentioned in Ari's paper. We have developed and operated a program with standards, rules, and policies to evaluate and accredit safe international online pharmacies. Our information is available on our website to consumers worldwide, and it empowers people to afford medication while not getting burned financially or hurt or even killed from a rogue website selling a falsified or substandard drug. In his remarks, Ron Andrew told you that about 5 million Americans buy medicine from other countries each year because of cost. To talk to you about that, I'm going to put on hat number two. I founded a nonprofit organization called Prescription Justice. Prescription Justice advocates for reforms to bring down drug prices in the US. That would mean fewer Americans are forced to buy medicines from other countries, whether through travel or online. So what's going on with drug prices? Let me tell you a story of a drug called Daraprim. In 2015, Martin Shkreli, a former hedge fund manager turned drug, drug company executive, became the poster child for greed in the pharmaceutical industry for raising the price of Daraprim from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill overnight. Daraprim treats a serious infection called toxoplasmosis, which can be fatal for people with HIV or cancer. It now sells for $3 in the UK, $750 still in the US. One more drug. The diabetes drug, it's type 2 diabetes, Genuvia, is about $16 a pill in the US, less than $4 a pill in Canada, $1 a pill in Turkey. That's for the same formulation of the same product by the same brand name drug company, Merck. According to the World Health Organization, high drug prices are a global public health crisis. In the US, people with cancer are twice as likely to end up in bankruptcy. Young adults and older Americans alike are facing financial hardship and also dying because they can't afford essential medicines. In fact, 29% of Americans report not having filled a prescription as directed because of costs within the last year. That's over 70 million people. Again, Prescription justice is advocating for reforms to bring down drug prices in the US so the prices don't force people to buy medicine from other countries. At the same time, we know, I know, that international online pharmacies are a lifeline for consumers worldwide who are slipping through the cracks of broken healthcare systems. So we also advocate to protect the ability of individual patients to import legitimate medicines if they cannot afford them domestically. 
the pharmaceutical industry wants to kill international online access, where it hurts their profits, and it appears to be using the domain name system to do so. In the fall of 2016, I, I published an article in Circle ID called Protecting Online Access to Safe and Affordable Medication. In that article, I explained my position that the drug companies are strategically extending their regulatory capture of U.S. laws to the Internet. One of their methods was funding an application by the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, which staunchly opposes personal importation in the U.S. to obtain the DOT pharmacy registry, which was approved. As I see it, that domain name space decreases competition, increases drug prices, and actually can end up misleading consumers about what is and what is not safe online. The article I wrote was very much a call to action for the internet and medicines access rights communities to get together to talk about this. I wrote in terms of access to medicines being a human right, as some in this community believe, access to the internet is also a human right. So as the internet community seeks to infuse the principles of international human rights law into the discourse and practice of internet governance, it can and should help maintain the widest possible access to safe and affordable medication. I'm not an internet governance and policy professional, although I've been learning a lot. I had no idea what good publishing the article would do. But Nick D'Agostino, who was one of the lead organizers of RightsCon, read my article and suggested it might be a good topic for RightsCon Brussels in 2017. So that led to a panel of experts and a first draft of principles written in concert with people from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Knowledge Ecology International, and Public Citizen. And then the year later at RightsCon in Toronto, we brought more stakeholders and academics, including Aria, who played an important role in finishing what is now the Brussels principles on the sale of medicine over the internet. Aria writes in his paper, what are the core values that should inform this discussion? And is it possible to reconcile competing legitimate interests of stakeholders in this internet pharmacy world? I really liked reading competing legitimate interests. There are indeed competing legitimate interests, but here's the problem as I've experienced it. There is an incredible power asymmetry between these legitimate competing interests, pitting the U.S. pharmacy corporations and multinational companies, which have massive financial and political power, against an evolving international online pharmacy industry, which at best is serving the public interests of patients worldwide, but it's undermining the profit models of the old, entrenched analog interests. The quintessential example of this asymmetry, as I see it, is the dot pharmacy application to ICANN, because it was funded with at least $360,000 from drug companies. Now, as I see it, it is used to stifle competition in a manner that hurts consumers. Why do I believe this? While there are very clear flexibilities within U.S. law to allow importation, the NABP has adopted the most restrictive interpretation, whereby any website that markets and sells prescriptions that are imported into the U.S. is automatically not eligible for a dot pharmacy. So in essence, as I see it, a U.S. Trade Association's self-serving interpretation of national law suddenly has an impact with dot pharmacy on the entire internet global market. And this despite multiple academic studies that show when internet pharmacies are credentialed, prescription importation is safe. The issue of people buying medications online because it's too expensive or not available locally is not well understood by most people in the internet policy and activist communities. It's just being better understood even among access to medicines activists. Understanding the Brussels principles 
does not require a PhD in public health or in internet governance. They are principles on which to build a better future on this issue of access to medicines. So to bring balance to that power asymmetry that I mentioned and Aria mentioned more academically and support the human right to safe and affordable medicines, supporting the Brussels principles is a great next step. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aria. Aria. Thank you very much, Gabe, I should say. Excellent, uh, excellent presentation in terms of the, um, the source and essence of it. And I, the Brussels principles, for those in the room, are on the screen, and I'm not sure if we see these in the hubs or not, uh, but they can be found at brusselsprinciples.org. And uh, that's a good starting point for sure. Um, I understand, uh, actually, Aria, if I just can turn to you for a second, the the work, when you saw the principles and worked through the principles, that led you to start thinking more about creating standards. Um, and the, the essence of the standards, could you share a little bit about what, where that would take us? Yes, yeah, so I, I think the, the way I thought about it coming from a multi-stakeholder, multi-lateral uh, 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 forum approach is uh, to what extent uh, can norms inform uh, standards and best practices uh, in in some ways taking a sort of a global governance approach that uh, you uh, at the same time need uh, a, a bottom-up uh, approach uh, but at the same time uh, you need broad consensus among both between states and among different stakeholders uh, on uh, particular issues so if you talk about for example uh, the right to health you need to make sure that it means the same thing if you're talking about access to internet pharmacies that we're talking about the same thing uh, and in a sense uh, establishing a set of norms uh, predicated on both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, and language within the WHO and other inter multilateral fora uh, where we already have concurrence. And then, in, in a way, uh, allowing this common understanding that the Global Status Report uh, argues sometimes underlies why regulation uh, is, is so difficult uh, when we're talking about cross-border legal issues. How can they inform future uh, action uh, in this space? And one of those, of course, is coherence, uh, both across countries and, and between countries and within countries, uh, but at the same time, thinking about that next step of, of how do you move from that to uh, the mechanisms within uh, these regions, countries, and, and, and subnationally, uh, and that is, is through laws and regulations. Uh, that uh, in this idea of norm diffusion are informed by a, a broad multi-stakeholder uh, agreed on a set of norms. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I, I believe we have a couple of uh, questions coming from our uh, hubs. I was informed earlier, is that true? Do we have anyone online with questions or thoughts, comments? There's none at this time. Um, I turn to the room. Anyone have any thoughts or questions they'd like to bring to the table on this uh, panel discussion? Thank you, sir. Uh, you have the floor. If you could kindly speak your name before you um, speak so that the people in the room and also in the hubs know who's speaking. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Rowney. Um, and I first confess this is not an area of my expertise. Uh, I came here under invitation. But I just want to make some comments as well. You know, I'm from the Global South, and uh, there is a massive problem, particularly in Africa, where, where I come from, uh, where we're restricted on the type of medicine we can get. It's expensive. We have a whole middleman process where, through the drug procurement, uh, people in general are restricted on where they can buy, and often it's through prescription, and often the people prescribing are getting kickbacks on the drugs that they're prescribing. Uh, there's a general lack of awareness of the alternates. And, you know, there is the risk of unsafe alternates. Uh, the concept of uh, procurement of drugs online I find interesting. Uh, but we also need to be aware of the constraints within Africa, where whilst we, we, we seem to have a number of people online, that doesn't mean that they have meaningful connectivity, it doesn't mean they can access uh, e-commerce. And e-commerce is not just about having internet access, it's having the means to pay, which means you've got to be digitally included as well as financially included. Um, we, 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 what I see is 
a, a more open way to enable our governments who tend to be the bulk procurement procurers of drugs uh, through the different uh, in-country health systems uh, to be able to buy drugs more affordably, which means they can buy more. We still got the problem of getting the drugs to the uh, clinics, uh, but that, that's a different challenge. Uh, I think it's good that the independent pharmacies who fulfill uh, a gap have access to more affordable drugs through different channels. Uh, you know, our channels to uh, drugs and medicines is quite restricted. And a lot of this comes down to, you know, local regulations which can be adapted to, to make it more flexible, but with the trust and, and also buying from, from uh, proper sources. Uh, if, if our independent pharmacies do have access to, and our governments have access to uh, less expensive drugs, it's also important that they pass on those savings. Because even though we get access to it cheaper, it doesn't mean that you're going to pass it on to the consumer or the, the end user. Uh, we, we, we do need to create better general public awareness uh, in our countries of what the options are, what the possibilities are, and, and, and keep them safe. And you know, today, it is a reality. You know, in Africa, people are dying due to the lack of access to the most affordable drug. Um, and that might be because it's just not available in their community, or they don't have the means to buy it. And you see cases where someone will be in the city, and the drug is in the city, they have the money to get it, but they still have to get it to the village. And by the time it can get there, you know, that person's already dead. So, you know, the issues are real. And we need to find a way to get the right drugs at the right price to those communities. And it's a complex issue. And I think this can help to solve some of those challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rowney. Uh, just a quick question. Are you, are you speaking in terms of one particular nation, or are you speaking in Africa in general, just for context? Af Africa is a complex and diverse continent. So each country has different dynamics, although there's some common shared uh, dynamics. But I'm, I'm from Namibia, which is in the south of Africa. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Any other thoughts or questions from the room? I see Gigi Levine. And Gigi, would you like to come forward, please? Thank you. And then uh, you will be next in the queue. Thank you very much. If you please state your name and uh, your, where you're from, your affiliation, that would be helpful for the uh, transcript. Thank you. Sure. I'm Gertrude Levine with the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, registry operator for the Dot Pharmacy TLD. And um, with the practice of pharmacy, just like the practice of medicine and the practice of law and, and many other uh, professional sectors, being regulated at the jurisdictional level, I'm just having trouble envisioning those uh, divergent um, regulatory bodies coming together on a single set of standards that is still um, strong and consistent enough to ensure um, competency of pharmacists, lawyers, doctors, and to ensure that their customers, their patients, are protected to, you know, by those regulations. I'm just not seeing how how those those things are going to converge into a universal set of guidelines. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a very good question, and I see Gabe would like to speak to that, and I think Ari will give you a minute or two to talk about that. So, Gabriel, please. Thank you for the question. Um, just quickly, I'm going to revert to the Brussels principles as the guidelines in order to get to this difficult consensus that um, Ms. Levine points out. Um, it's going to take time. It's going to take independent academic inquiry. It's going to take international bo bodies to um, develop these standards and governance mechanisms. But these mechanisms should be independent of industry entirely as much as we can do. And as we get there, associations that are 
that I believe have vested commercial interests should not be holding the reins and, um, as I see it, restraining trade. Um, there has to be a better bridge forward so that we're not blocking people's access to affordable medication on the internet. We're hopefully they can afford medications locally, but where there are the safest international online pharmacies, we have to make room for people to obtain medications from them. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Um, I'd like Ari to speak, but I'm going to say just for a minute because we have about six or seven minutes left and we have a, people, a few people in the queue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Levine. I think the, the question, I think, is, is incredibly pressing, and I think it gets to that issue of, of how do you balance that interest, that it's, 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 uh, it ought not be, or, or this panel ought not be, uh, I think, uh, uh, a, a misrepresent, or, or at least uh, we shouldn't walk out of here uh, thinking that this is a blanket advocacy that, that we should uh, uh, sort of open up uh, this particular space, because as part of balancing that interest, the role as both a, a pharmacist as well as regulatory authorities, as that you point out, are uh, still uh, deeply jurisdictional uh, is to protect uh, patient safety and consumer uh, safety, and particularly uh, when they go uh, online. Now, these issues uh, sometimes there is sort of uh, 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 we look a sort of we take a sort of blind eye uh, with with certain consumer goods, for example, uh, when they come from places where, for example, the regulatory standards aren't uh, the best. And uh, when it is a public health issue, uh, like for example with uh, with vaping pens, for example, a few years ago, uh, it's possible to take very swift action but within a jurisdictional uh, uh, capacity. Uh, but at the same time, there are uh, channels, uh, and that's in a sense hopefully the point of, 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 of my paper, uh, that we can explore where harmonization uh, is possible and uh, there are precedents where on particular issues there have been either bilateral or multilateral harmonization and coherence efforts. On a bilateral example, for example, on a bilateral, bilateral level, uh, for example, uh, there are uh, national medicines regulatory authorities that have a mutual recognition of regulatory competence, for example, which in many ways allows, for example, this, uh, this idea of sort of the caravan of uh, ca caravan to Canada, of, of, of Americans coming to Canada, purchasing drugs uh, from registered Canadian pharmacies and, and importing them uh, into uh, the U.S. And, and in uh, uh, the, the, the regulations, there's clear guidelines specifically on, on Canadian importation. But at the multilateral level as well, uh, there are at least a couple uh, of, of these uh, fora, like, for example, the International Council of Harmonization uh, that includes not just regulatory agencies, but also IFPMA, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers, uh, as well as uh, the, the group that I showed, the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities, uh, where uh, a big part of the goal is not to impose, uh, but to have greater cooperation and coordination uh, around a common understanding of a problem. Like, for example, in my field, what do we mean when we're talking about a counterfeit drug? What do we mean when we're talking about, within there, a falsified versus a substandard versus an unauthorized uh, or unapproved drug, which is a market authorization uh, problem. Now, or around, for example, things like uh, uh, good manufacturing practices or, or other good practices. Uh, and the goal of this ought not be uh, sort of a total uh, liberalization of the market, uh, but to have greater conversations uh, at, across countries uh, to develop a common understanding where there are absolutely legitimate risks, but where there are also opportunities uh, where that harmonization could potentially uh, provide a greater access and through that uh, improve access. Uh, to public access to medicines. Thank you, Arya. And I, I would just tag on to that, that in this room yesterday, about the same time, uh, Internet and Jurisdiction were going through uh, their new uh, report, uh, the Global Status Report. And it, it, be, it appears more and more to me personally that there's a, a convergence of the thinking uh, in terms of the work that, that that body is undertaking and the work ARIA is undertaking. So there, I believe there is a pathway, and I'm very grateful that you brought this on the table because it is one of those questions, you know, how, how does one get there with all of this patchwork of regulation? You're absolutely right, uh, Gigi, and so thank you for bringing that forward. Uh, madam, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Could you please state your name? Thank you. Uh, Karen Riley, based here in Berlin with Status 404. I'm thrilled to have a, a pharmacist on the panel because um, I work primarily on internet policy, but I'm also an asthma patient who travels around the world. And of all the industries um, that are 
could be subject to regulatory capture. Medicine should not be it. We have the data sets. We have empirical evidence of what works and what doesn't, um, and especially across different countries. If I go to Spain, I can get an albuterol inhaler for five euro without a prescription. Um, because under medicine, we have triage, treat an urgent problem first. You can't breathe right now. You should be under the care of a physician, but you can't breathe right now. Um, a woman in New Jersey was denied an albuterol inhaler because she lacked $1.50 that she needed for her copay of $21.50. And she had to call an ambulance because of that. Um, in the United States as well, um, primatine mist and inhaled epinephrine is back over the counter, um, which is contraindicated by a lot of pul pulmonologists, but you cannot get an albuterol inhaler over the counter, and it ranges from um, you know, $5 copay to $60 for something that has to be purchased every month. Um, so I would say have a pharmacist-centered approach have a medical-centered approach, and we already have evidence of what works and what doesn't in terms of pharmacies. And harmonization should not necessarily be the responsibility of uh, lobbyist organizations. I would like to have a lot more discussions among medical providers first. Thank you very much. That's very, very valuable. Um, I see Klaus, uh, and um, it's now coming up to about uh, one minute away from our closing time. I think we might go over just a minute. If there's anybody else who has a burning question uh, uh, after Klaus, please let me know. Otherwise, Klaus, you get the last word. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, um, Klaus Stoll, uh, the Prokes Group. It's a little bit of a pity that not a lot of people are in the room because basically what we are talking about all the time, uh, we are missing the point. We are missing the point that this is all about digital governance as a whole. And, we need, and this sh uh, should be discussed uh, in full plenary and digital pharmacies, digital health, everything you mentioned and so on, trademark, copyright, it all belongs together and needs to be discussed. And we shouldn't be in that little silo, medicine, pharmacy or something like that. No, this is something which is a symbol for everything. And as somebody who's, uh, uh, who's a little bit engaged with ICANN, when I hear that uh, thing about dot pharmacy, I'm still getting a stomach ache. So, I'm, okay, I'm getting the stomachache, but that doesn't help us. So, it, uh, what helps us to find the right policies that these things don't happen again. So, what I would encourage uh, everybody is don't see it as a pharmacy problem. Don't see it as a medical thing. This is digital governance as a whole. Thank you. Well, sir, I think you've summarized it as best as anyone could. Thank you very much for that, Klaus. Um, I would like to uh, thank all of my panelists today, um, uh, Okio Lafui, Arya Ilya Ahmad, and uh, Gabriel Levitt, um, and all of the voices that came forward today. This is exactly what uh, Chancellor uh, Merkel said. We need the voices to speak up. And uh, the things I've heard today um, really excite me, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing more contributions from all of you uh, in this very important issue. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for those online uh, for watching. And I'll now bring this session to a close. Thank you again. I, yeah, I would also note on the corner table there, please grab and uh, take a copy of the, of the freshly printed, uh, updated uh, document. Thank you very much. Okay.